and welcome to Hospice Insights, The Lawn Beyond, where we connect you to what matters in the ever-changing world of hospice and palliative care. Part one, what's the latest on UPIX? Highlights from recent audit activity. Brian, my favorite podcast <laughs> partner. Um, Meg. <laughs> wow, this is, I feel like, was this the subject of our first podcast ever? Like, I don't know how many years ago now, I feel like you picked. So, so <laughs> six, seven years later, we're still talking about them, but there's new stuff. Some's new, like old is new and new, new. Yeah, everything old is new again, or there's nothing new under the sun, you know, however you want to put it. Uh, yeah, it, it seems like we're in this cycle of talking about audits. There is, they do run in cycles in terms of how frequent they are, the tactics they use. Every once in a while, they do something new. Uh, but but yeah, here we are talking again about UPIX, but it's important stuff. I mean, the UPIX are the the fraud investigators and auditors. It's usually pretty high stakes when they're out there. Uh, so we want to make sure the hospices are are aware of the latest news with what's going on. So it could really be like part 20 or 30, or <laughs> maybe you should keep a running list. But but we broke in the in book this I'm right. I'm writing a book yeah. about you pick. It'll be chapter 32. <laughs> on now, so. Um, so but we're dividing this podcast. So it's bite size into two parts. So t- the first part that we're going to talk about is extrapolation, which isn't sort of a new thing, but some some new trends going on there. And then we're going to talk about nursing home room and board payments, um, because everyone probably listening knows that you picks a number of years ago, actually, their role was expanded. They used to be called Z picks, and they did Medicare, and then they changed their name unified program integrity contractor audits. And then CMS gave them the responsibility to do not just Medicare, but also Medicaid. And how the Medicaid audits work in Medicare are in some ways similar, but they're also really different. We're not going to get into all of that stuff. But obviously, when you talk about Medicaid and hospice, you got to talk about nursing home room and board because I feel like anytime UPICs try to get into this or even when ZPICs try to do this, they get very confused about what is a hospice service and then what is a non-hospice service. So that's what we're going to cover here um, in these few minutes in part one. And then we're going to talk about some other stuff in part two. But but our favorite topic, extrapolation. Um, and so <laughs> we've been doing battle on these issues for many, many, many um, years. But what's the new stuff that we should be talking about? Because it, it is, there was not much going on and now there's been more activity. So, so what's the latest, Brian? Yeah. And well, well, the latest is the law has been developing and there are, uh, I think new approaches that the auditors are taking to extrapolation, which has led to new ways to try to attack what they are doing or criticize them as legally insufficient. So in this whole cyclical nature of audits that, that, we have been talking about, Meg, uh, you know, years ago, we kind of encountered an extrapolation and, and we found ways to undermine them. You know, none of our clients uh, had had to ever pay an extrapolated overpayment because we found flaws in how they assembled the universe and all that. Then those audits subsided, the extrapolation subsided, then they've come back. Uh, and And some of the new arguments are being developed at the federal court level, and we're a part of that as well. Uh, and so it it just shows that no matter how often they do it, uh, there's always new creative ways to try to attack what attack what they're doing and show it as legally insufficient. And it's really important to invest the resources in a statistician retained by counsel to get this done. Because when you're talking extrapolations, we've had them uh, anywhere from a million to. Forty-eight million dollars uh, and a bunch in the twenty millions. It's a bet the company type of stuff for for most hospices. And, and that's where you, you know the the underlying face value overpayment is always like if it's a hundred thousand dollars, that might be. So it is really the thing that makes this so gigantic. And so we always talk about there's two ways to win an extrapolated case, which is one, you beat on the statistics or you chisel down by winning individual claims, because then obviously if you win everything, who cares if it's extrapolated? 
zero extrapolated, I think is still zero. <laughs> right, Brian? <laughs> well, yeah, they haven't figured out a way around that yet, but maybe that's what we'll be podcasting about next year. So we'll zero see. Zero is not zero. <laughs> Just like if someone dies, that doesn't mean they're terminally ill. Well, Brian. of course not. You, that, you <laughs> don't jump to those conclusions. <laughs> yeah, death is not indicative of terminality. But, right. <laughs> okay, that aside. So at least for right now, zero is zero. So if you chisel it away down to something very small and sometimes even less than zero, you can't extrapolate it because it's too imprecise. But, you know, what are you, you finding in this latest round of extrapolations? Right. So what what, what has been happening in the latest round and what what uh, we and providers have been picking up on is that some auditors are not being fully transparent in the documentation they are providing relating to the extrapolation. No, Brian. What? <laughs> a, a bit of a lack of transparency. <laughs> I know it's, it goes against every instinct of theirs, perhaps, <laughs> to to be transparent. But the the, Mo, the Medicare program integrity manual requires the auditors to provide documentation such that the provider can replicate or recreate certain aspects of the sam- of the audit of the extrapolation such as the sampling frame or the sample and in order for that replication or recreation to uh, be carried out we need to have a lot of documents so you can track how they identified the universe, which is typically every claim submitted by the hospice over, let's say, a two-year period, uh, how they went from that that set of claims to a sampling frame, which may have excluded certain parts of the universe, such as zero-paid claims or claims that were previously adjudicated. And that's how you get to the sampling frame, which could still be tens of thousands of claims and then we need to know how did they get from the sampling frame to the sample, which could be you know 30 to 100 claims. Uh, and it's that sample that they review and extrapolate from. So you, know, you get 30 claims, they deny half of them. Uh, like you said, the overpayment for 15 claims, maybe that's $75,000 or you know 100,000, but they extrapolate it to the entire sampling frame or universe, and that's where you get the millions of dollars. So picking away at those claims in the sample, but also if they're not gonna give us the documentation to recreate or replicate some of these things, uh, that's, a, that's a basis on which to invalidate the entire sampling process. And all this stuff probably sounding Greek to most people, but this is something, as you said, you can't do this alone. and. Even as smart as lawyers are, right, and <laughs> capable of anything, right, we're still not statisticians, and you really need someone with the qualifications because they're going to, just like you need, you know, an expert physician to testify, you still need an expert statistician. And this is something you don't want to wait till, you know, late in the game to bring up because you want to get you know develop these arguments out of the box even though these if you're going to win on them it's probably not going to happen till alj you just really want to start um you know building these arguments because i think brian in some of these cases we're working on even though it's not overturned at lower levels we start getting additional information sometimes or because Oftentimes we're doing Freedom of Information Act requests, sometimes related to to get documents. And so sometimes you're getting additional documents um, throughout the process, but then you need to update your arguments for and all that stuff. So Exactly. And the government, they're continuing to evaluate the statistical issues as well. So when you go through the appeal process, and, and, and I agree, Meg, you got to have a statistician early on because you want the government to start reacting to your arguments. Uh, the, the MACs, the Medicare Administrative Contractors, they may send a statistician's report out to their own statistician for comment, and then they'll generate another report. The same with the QUIC. And again, they're not always super transparent. In a recent case, we learned uh, we learned that the I think it was the quick had actually sent out their uh, our report our statistician's report to an independent statistician. I think it might have been referenced in the reconsideration decision. 
but they never gave us anything from that <laughs> third party statistician. <laughs> so then we were asking about that. Well, you got to give us that. They gave it to us. And lo and behold, that report actually helped our case. Uh, mm. And so now that's become an important exhibit for us because there's some agreement between our statistician and the people, the, the statistician that the quick retained about the implications for some problems with the statistical uh, exercise. So you got to keep on them. You got to make sure you're reading carefully decisions. Like you said, Freedom of Information Act request. Uh, don't don't trust that they're, the government is giving you every document that is relevant. You got to do your own due diligence and pursue those. And maybe you'll come up with something very valuable like we have. Which... I don't want to be braggy, Brian, but this is why I think we're the best in the country at doing this. We've been doing it a long time, and I think we are relentless and find new ways to do things and, you know, get information that can be helpful. And so, I mean, you just can't – same old, same old is not how yeah. you do – I mean, the general – framework has stayed the same to some extent, but I think how we approach these cases continues to evolve and we learn new yeah. things and, and stuff like that. So I think in the volume of the work that we do, it's just we end up having so much experience and um, yeah, work and around. Yeah, and, and it's it kind of like as we work with physicians, it, I, I don't think it's something that you could just hire a statistician because uh, there's a there's a collaboration between us and the statisticians because they don't necessarily know hospice or, or can pick up on some of the arguments. So we've worked with statisticians to uh, enlighten them on new arguments and ideas and vice versa. So it's really the combination that exists exists that has allowed us to be very comprehensive and, like you said, relentless in our efforts. Uh, the, the, another new issue that you might want to look out for if you're the subject of an extrapolation is what are these statisticians excluding from the universe or sampling frame? And a pretty hot button issue now is are they excluding what they call zero paid claims or are they excluding claims of less than a certain dollar value, like less than a thousand dollars? There's there's a court activity around whether that's appropriate, because when they exclude zero paid or less than a thousand dollar paid claims, they're taking away potentially a lot of claims that would reduce an extrapolated overpayment. I mean, you can imagine if the only thing they're pulling are claims worth ten thousand or more. Uh, and they're denying them, then that's ten thousand a pop that's extrapolated yeah. as opposed to them reviewing a two hundred dollar claim yeah. or you know or a four hundred dollar claim and denying that. So uh, if you see that and you should get statistical documents that lay out some of the parameters of the analysis. So you can check that for yourself. But if you see anything like that, uh, get get counsel, get a statistician, and they can help develop or identify other opportunities for you in these arguments. Well, and moving on to the room and board issue, which is also a really big dollar value um, issue because, and the upshot here is that a common mistake that is made by state auditors, Medicaid auditors, as well as UPIC is they look at how much we were paid by Medicaid <laughs> And they don't think about whether or not, um, you know, the payments represent room and board payments or hospice patients. So, and there's a lot more Medicaid UPICs going on. So that's sort of in and of itself a new sort of trend. It's not like the first of their kind, but they're resurging again. But the very first thing you want to do when you get a UPIC audit and it, it has Medicaid the first question is, are these Medicaid-only patients or are they dual eligible? Because if they're looking at anyone who's dual eligible, what does that mean? That means that Medicare paid for the hospice services and Medicaid paid for the room and board services. And even the federal OIG has said, and we cite this um, to auditors, is that the pass-through room and board payment, that's not hospice services. And the hospice conditions of payment do not apply to nursing home room and board services. So there's nothing if they're pulling only dual eligible patients, then they're not auditing 
Medicaid hospice claims. They're auditing Medicaid room and board, which whether or not they're eligible for hospice has nothing to do with that, right? Um, but I feel like the very first UPIC, or it was ZPIC back then, audit I worked on, which is probably, I don't know, could it be 15 years ago? I mean, Sister Mary when was you were, on our team. When you were just 19, you were yeah, doing these, Yeah, when I was mags? 19, because I'm a prodigy. <laughs> um, we were, um, we had to go to battle um, over, with health integrity over this issue. And I think we've made shorter work of it as of late, but um, it's still troubling to me that we have to, you know, people have to pay legal fees and other things to deal with this. But I think the word to the wise here, though, is before you spend a bunch of time gathering records and doing all this stuff, are these actually Medicaid hospice patients or are they all dual eligibles living in a nursing home? And so, you know, because you want to get out ahead of this as soon as possible. Yeah. And, and the, like you said, Meg, the financial stakes are significant. I mean, room and board can be as much as or more than the hospice payments you're receiving. So we worked on this in Florida not too long ago, where auditors initially had come in, and they were identifying both the hospice payment and the room and board payment. And that was with Medicaid patients, but it still applies there, even for Medicaid patients on the Medicaid hospice benefit. Uh, the room and board aspect of that is not a hospice services, and it should not uh, be uh, – they should not be going after the hospice for those kinds of payments. Once we raised that to their attention and advocated for it and kind of finally convinced them of that, it cut the overpayment in half just like that. Uh, and on the Medicare side, what, what – uh, or on the UPIC side, what can be a little confusing is now, as you said, they are unified – program integrity contractors. They do both. However, it seems like internally they have different staff doing the Medicare and the Medicaid side. And sometimes I think they get a bit confused about what their particular role is. So you get a meta, you get a, a, a letter from a UPIC like Safeguard or Clarent. They should tell you initially in the first couple paragraphs, is this a Medicare or a Medicaid audit? Uh, and that is your clue. If you say Medi if you see Medicaid audit, you know, again, look at those patients, because we recently had one where they said this is a Medicaid audit, but these were patients who were duly eligible receiving the hospice Medicare benefit and pass through. Once we alerted them to that, and uh, Meg kind of used the arguments that have been tried and true for us over the years, the audit was terminated. You know, I, I, and I think that's because they have finally realized, yeah, as Medicaid auditors, there's nothing for us to do here. These are Medicare hospice payments, and uh, the Medicaid room and board is not a hospice services. So why are we bugging a hospice about that? Yeah, these are the same auditors who do this repeatedly. So it's not <laughs> like they learn. Yeah, uh, because I'm sure they have turnover and whatnot. But we kind of make this these arguments cyclically. You know, as it comes yeah. up. We, we dust off the arguments and then make them again. And it should be a result you can achieve. Uh, but you got to you got to kind of keep track of the laws. It's developing and know how to make the argument in a in a persuasive way. Yeah. And the big takeaway there is don't the, talking to a lawyer sort of really when you get that record request like day one, because then in terms of figuring out how you want to respond, because sometimes people are like, oh, I'll handle the record request by myself. And then it's like, you don't want to wait to then get a demand for this to then bring up this issue because you're going to have to spend more money and to have a demand out there. I mean, it just, you know, it's it's you want to get out in ahead and of the this. Well, yeah, and the government may have your money by that time. Yeah. And so now yeah. you're chasing after it as opposed to preventing them from taking the money in the first place. And like we said, this is money you don't have, right? You probably got 95% of that, passed it through, plus paid the other 5%, which the federal government has said isn't a kickback. So you're out. This is money that you never got, you don't have in your bank account. You can't recoup it from the nursing home. I mean, it's it's you know, significant financially um, because you don't have have any of this, this money. Um, so anyway, well, those are the nuggets for today, Brian, but we're going to move on to 
part two um, for next time. I can't wait. I can't That's right. wait, Brian. There's some teasers in the description, so you'll have to you know, remain on the edge of your seat, and then we'll get into the part two issues. But since we release podcasts every three weeks, they'll have to wait. So, But I'll do, we'll do them sequentially, so you only have to wait a mere three weeks to hear part That's two. That's awfully generous of you, Meg. I think that's a yeah. great move. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Till next time, Brian. Thanks, Meg. Well, that's it for today's episode of Hospice Insights, The Law and Beyond. Thank you for joining the conversation. To subscribe to our podcast, visit our website at hushblackwell.com or sign up wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, may the wind be at your back. <laughs>